So, dear colleagues, dear friends, sorry for the slight delay. Um, this is the best of the best session. Ehud Asya from Israel and myself will be chairing this. We have an esteemed panel of colleagues who are going to discuss. Gabo Shariot from Germany, Thomas Kronen from Germany, Paolo Vinciguerra from here, Milano, Italy, and Nick Royce from the Netherlands. We're going to talk, the first session is about videos. These are the Video Prize Award winners. And then we'll have a second block. We'll change some of our discussions. And we'll talk about papers, um, posters, and so forth. As you probably know, this meeting has been more successful than we had anticipated. We had 8,500 delegates here, 3,500 friends and colleagues from industry. Um, you saw the program of the last few days it was very, very dense, tight, and a few of the innovative things which were shown will be shown actually now in this, in this uh, session. So I think we'll get started. Ehud, any, anything you still want to add? Well, let's, let's get running. Let's get running. All right, let's go. So this is the first video. Do you want to? Yes, this is the first video. Wait, uh, the videos are categorized to several uh, videos. Can we have the title first? Uh, can we go back, one back again? Thank you. Uh, this is the first uh, category, which is a difficult and special cases. And this uh, video is entitled Intraocular Lens Exchange and Intracapsular Artificial Iris Implant in Capsular Back Phimosis, in which you also say in a patient with RK. So let's see the video. Please. Although the capsular bag is fibrotic with some phimosis, and there is also a glaucomatous optic neuropathy. The surgical plan is to exchange the IOL to address the hyperopia and implant a custom made silicon iris prosthetic device inside the bag. And using the same Lester hook, I can lift the eye well out of the bag to allow uh, cutting it into three pieces and removing it through the main port. So now the eye well is out, the capsular bag is empty. I am putting in a capsular tension ring with the purpose of avoiding late contraction of the bag and talking of the future artificial iris in. The capsule and the fibrosis are stained with tripan blue, and I'm inserting a hydrophobic eye well inside the capsule. The goal here is not necessarily removing every bit of fibrosis. We just want to restore the elasticity of the capsular bag opening. A small cut in the rex's edge allows for enlargement of the capsular bag opening. The artificial iris can now be inserted through the 2.2 millimeter incision. And you can now appreciate the kind of elasticity we need to accommodate the artificial iris inside the bag. So this closes our case. The patient did great with a good aesthetic result and a great functional result with a best corrective visual acuity of 0.9 with just 0.25 diopters of correction. All right. Okay, so this was only 30 seconds out of the seven minutes of the video. But uh, my first question to the panel would be, you had like three porcelain TVs in one main incision in which you put the, the forceps in and pull out the lens and then put the artificial iris. And this is a case with the RK, eight cuts. Would you do the same going through the limbal incision or do it through a scleral wound? Any tips in cases of post-RK and compromised cornea? I would probably do the uh, sterile tunnels to avoid increasing the esteem. Otherwise, even if it's more difficult to change the lens, but what can be the meter of sclera before to end, we can probably reduce a little bit of esteem. I mean, also, the, you know, why was Vision Blue used? I mean, we know Vision Blue changes the elasticity of the capsule when we do cataract surgery. Do you think it also changes the elasticity after several years after surgery with fibrosis? Definitely, definitely. And I, I like very much in this video that he removed the fibrotic tissue. Um, and this gives a lot back of the elasticity of the capsular bag. and. Uh, that I like that very really much. This step. To a point. It was quite difficult, so you move as much as you can. Once you felt it's dangerous, you stop, just cut and put it down. So yep. you need to know where to stop. Ehud, I think to the point you made with the incisions, in radial keratotomy, very often you have different parts. So sometimes the incisions are larger. Eight incisions. 
so well, eight incisions, so, so you can do it. Eight incisions means you can do a 2.2 millimeter clear cornea incision and you can remove. He basically took three parts with his plate haptic eyewear, so he cut it in three parts, so you can maintain your clear cornea incision. It's a good argument also to have a spare tunnel. You could do this, but the colleague here did really fine and, and he could manage through the small incision everything. Uh, as for the implants, would you use an implant that would go into the bag or outside of the bag? You need to remove a lens from the inside the capsule in a, in a patient after many, after, after many years, so the capsule may not be that stable. And to put in an artificial iris, that's not always an easy game. Well, I, I think that the best place for any lens is in the, in the capsular bag. So I would do, try to do the same. So if you have, if, if the zonules appear to be stable, I think this position will be the best for the lens. And if the cover, capsule was not stable, what would be your plan B? I would do a, a multi-piece lens in the, in the sulcus. So you have support, the haptics are, are supported in the angle, in the, in the sulcus, and then you could try to make an optic capture, so to stabilize the lens and also have some uh, stabilization of the, of the capture bag, because the multi-piece is, is, is stabilized in the sulcus on the, on the sclera. The truth is actually what I recommend to everyone, you never know what will happen. So there can be even cases, everything goes as smooth as shown here, but you can even lose the whole capsular bag, and then you have to, it's not a plan B, it's a plan C or D, actually, a backup plan, and I, I have shown a couple of years ago that even intraspheral haptic fixation together with an artificial iris could work, but you should have a backup plan or B, C, D. So you would suture the same iris that was supposed to go into the bag, you would just suture to the sclera? Yeah, possible. So oftentimes it's a different type of artificial iris. Yep. It's a bit thicker, so you can go through it. Yeah. Well, I think it's also, you know, it wouldn't be a problem that if, the, if, if you don't, if you can't save the bag, you can leave the patient aphakic for a few days or a few weeks to get a new, you know, get a new uh, artificial iris implant if the one you've ordered would not fit. I mean, you know, this is, because I think there's no question this patient needs a small pupil because with no pupil, no iris, you know, obviously. An archaic. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Hey, Hutu, you, you pointed out the capsular back fixation of the eye. Well, as far as I saw it, he put in a capsular tension ring. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that, that's a good, you know, nominator if your capsule is kind of, you know, doesn't fall apart. So if you put that in, you get a good feeling if the zonules are kind of still functioning and then you can put the lens in the capsule back like you did. Yes, but my point was that you need plan B and C, as you said, to know that you may not use a capsule in these cases. You, you can never know, you know how we start. You can never know how it will go from here on. Okay, I think we'll go to the next case. Although the capsular bag is fibrotic with some phimosis. Oh, yeah. Sorry. So this is uh, the um, video that won the educational uh, first prize. And it's all about the anterior capsule. And it's by Bobby Osher. Compromised visualization may also be caused by a white cortical opacity. Again, the capsular rexus is rescued using tripan blue. A break in the capsular rexus margin can be very subtle, yet ignoring or missing this defect could turn a routine case into a nightmare, so the notch is excised. The intumescent white cataract has its own risk profile. The culprit is not the tripan blue, but rather the increased endolenticular pressure that produces the Argentinian flag sign. It is important to pressurize the anterior chamber with a retentive OVD like Helon 5, which flattens the lens bow. A small capsular rexus is made. Now the case becomes routine and with intraocular scissors and forceps, the rexus can be safely enlarged. Do I see a little cortical strand in the peripheral bag? Is the enemy of good better? Did the anterior capsule just split? Can I pretend it didn't happen? If we're careful, a toric lens can be safely implanted. 
The toric lens is aligned with the thermodots, and all is well. Knowledgeable management of complications involving the anterior capsule will result in a lovely eye, a satisfied surgeon, and a happy patient. All right, so this is obviously the educational part. Um, so I just wanted to ask, you know, you saw, uh, we get these intermessence cataracts, you know, once in a while, and, uh, and uh, we obviously you know, usually use vision blue. So what, what's your strategy? Because there's many strategies. There's strategies of going in with a phaco and punching out a central hole. There's obviously the strategy of making a small hole and aspirating uh, 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 fluid. There's the, you know, viscoelastic, you know, using essentially a, a viscoadaptive, which will really flatten the anterior capsule. So I just have to, like to have your, your sort of, you know, your way of doing it. Um, Let's start with you. Simply, um, I use a viscoadaptive um, OVD, and I use an endoforceps through the side port incision to ma mm -hmm. make really sure that um, I don't lose uh, OVD because flattening the anterior chamber, in my understanding, is the key to prevent um, um, Ar Argentinian flag. Do you aspirate? Usually not. So, okay. And you go for a small rexus and then enlarge, or do you go for a large rexus to start with? No, usually a little smaller. Okay. Thomas? I do, I do viscoadaptive uh, OVDs, but then I usually puncture the capsule and de-inflate de the capsule bag. I, I try to do this with just a blunt needle, take a little bit out of this, and, and then do my small capsule rexus and later enlarge it. So I think it's a good way, like Bobby showed here, that you don't go for a large capsule rexus. You can do everything through a three, five millimeter, but to inflate the capsule bag, I think it's a good part. And which, which uh, what canada do you use? It's like a, a 27 gauge, yeah. something like that. Small so not, gauge. not too thin. And I just go to the peritonitis usually. Yeah. I don't go to the main incision because that's even, even if you have viscoelastic substance in there, you can have a flat anterior chamber. So I think it's better to go to the... Paolo, to the what's your approach? Good point to have high, high density viscoelastic substance to flat the anterior chamber because it's a matter of a vectorial analysis. If the capsule is concave, is convex, the force is going outside. If it's convex, going inside. So making it flat is the main point. And what do you do, the rexus size? Do you go for a small rexus or do you try to go for the... For the S smaller one, me too. Or sometimes I make just a small hole without making any opening with a 30 gauge needle in the center. And aspirate. And leave to de-inflate the capsule. Just the hole. Just a hole. Not okay. Just to then let it. create the opening, inject the visco, and while the visco get in, they inflate and then start in the rexus. Nick? Yeah, I, 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 I use a high cohesive, cohesive viscoelastic uh, to flatten the lens. And then I take a, a three millimeter syringe with a 23 gauge needle on it. Uh, and I've got some BSS in it. And I eject some fluid so that you have fluid all the way. And I enter through the side port incision. And at the moment where I will enter the capsular bag uh, to, to deflate it, just in front of that, I start applying uh, some pressure on it, and I go inside and I take out some of the, of the liquefied cortex and try to flatten the, the capsule a little bit more, like have a, a convex uh, way, and I take that out, and then I, I start my, my capsule rexus. I often just will see how the rexus behaves. Mm -hmm. If it's not running out, I have to say I do a normally sized rexus, which is a five millimeter, 5.5. If it tends to run out, I get some extra cohesive viscoelastic, uh, high cohesive to flatten the lens for, further. And is there anything you do differently? Uh, yes, I will punch with a 30 gauge needle right at the center and then deflate. Mm -hmm. It all happens in the first five seconds. If you deflate, you de depressurize, then everything is going well. If you allow it to open up, then it may extend. So uh, I, punching and aspirating is the first thing for me to do. And, and then from there on, usually it's... And special viscoelastic or, or, or standard viscoelastic? Well, I could use if not necessarily viscoadaptive. I don't want a you know, five, which is like, you know, like a mud in the eye. Mm -hmm. I prefer high, high viscous, like 1.6 or 2. But, mm -hmm. but more than the regular. Olive, you may want to discuss the, uh, the use of a femtosecond laser because if you have a very fast one, I'm talking a very fast one, 
and you can produce any size of capsulotomy in two seconds, and you can even use it in these cases. Mm -hmm. Now, you don't, you shouldn't have a, uh, a low, you know, I mean, a slow one, and you have to really hold the lens in the right position. With other words, if you start Rexit at one part, and it goes over, so it really has to go like in two seconds of but everything. If the eye is not open, there is no difference in pressure from inside the eye, outside the eye. It doesn't matter. It, it's not a great matter if it is a fast or a slow. The eye is pressurized, and so if uh, I think that any femtosecond laser can make but, a. Uh, I think a, Thomas make a point should be fast. To make it fast, it should be docking exactly in a flat, so that the cornea, the the the, the capsule is do not need compensation, otherwise we will start to have in some area and then reaching the other. Yeah. So you have a perfect docking to be fast. Have you ever seen rapture or Argentinian flag falling femto? I'm we only... I'm, I'm, I, I never saw a uh, a See, I'm only afraid because if you have... If, if the eye is not located 100% correct, so in other words, this one, and you start your rexus here, or a capsulotomy, then it goes over and you have all the liquid-type material, and it, so it blocks a little bit the, the, the view of the femtosecond laser. That can be a problem. The best thing is you locate it right, have a fast one, and it works very well. Usually it's less than one second. It takes 0.9 yeah. seconds. If it's well docked, it's very fast. Yeah, it's, it's well <laughs> correct. Just one more question. You know, we saw the radial tear, and he obviously put a toric lens in there. So are you worried at all with a radial tear? Is there an, a, a situation where you say radial tear, no, I want to go into a sulcus, I don't want to put a bag lens in? Or what, you know, especially for the trainees, because this is educational, right? What are the, the, the pitfalls when you have a radial tear? Do you have to be more careful or just do your normal procedure and not care? Well, I think you... Bobby showed this case exactly had the radial tear just where he had to put the marks, which is unfortunate, because if it would be 90 degrees away, that would be much easier, but that's the case. You have a toric axis, you have to place it. It seems to be good controlled, and I think you can do it. They may have long-term a little bit more decentration to one side, but as it's just a monofocal toric lens, I wouldn't worry. You would put it in? Yeah. I would, uh, do is I put... It, is it plate optic toric lens? This was not a plate optic. No, no, no but, but if, 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 was, if, if... I don't put, I don't put money <laughs> plate optic. <laughs> yeah. That's, 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 that's an easy way, that's an easy way out. Stop. <laughs> I also wouldn't worry, and, but, but it's very much depending on the type of IR you are using and the, the IR material. So in what Bob Osher showed, uh, this is obviously a material that is more forgiving, with relatively soft haptics, and I think uh, I would go straight forward placing it into the capsular bag. But I mean, because the other problem is if you go for the um, circles fixation, these lenses usually and do not fit in the circles. They have sharp edges. You risk that you get an uveitis glaucoma hemorrhage syndrome, iris chaffing, etc. So that was be really my last choice. Right. But, but, but coming back to IOL type, the plate haptic style, I mean, I've, I've had one case actually also toric and the same situation, but I had a plate haptic ready for that patient. And actually what happened is that one of the haptics was it, not actually, the, essentially the haptic was in the radial tear because it was exactly that axis. And then it, it actually turned as a result of that. So I had to re-go, and it actually, at the end, the patient was okay. But I think, is this really, I believe this should be done with open-loop lenses. I feel much more comfortable with open-loop lenses in a situation with a radial tear like this. Do you also see it that if way? If I have a plate optics, I prefer to insert a tension ring, because if after some time shrink the bag and the lens turn, I have very difficult to replace. If I have a tension ring, the bag right, will be... But, but here, do you want to put a tension ring in this eye with a radial tear? No, 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 no. no. Not it, in this case. Not in this case. case. Generally, okay. generally speaking, actually, if I have to do a plate, I prefer tension ring. Actually, this lens, what he put in, is like a little bit functions like a, a capsular tension ring because the, 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 the loop is actually going exactly in that direction. And the radial tear, if it doesn't puncture the posterior capsule, which you would see, then it only goes to the equator, otherwise it would rupture the posterior capsule. Yeah. I had a discussion with Richard Peckett once about what kind of a lens you could put into, because when I was a resident, it was being said that you couldn't put a single piece lens in the bag within, well, in, in my teaching hospital where I was being taught cataract surgery, that you couldn't put a single piece lens in the bag with an anterior mm -hmm. capsule tear. So then some more uh, education out that that was possible, but at least you shouldn't put in a multi-piece lens in the capture bag. What Richard Becker told me, he said, that should be fine. He's done it. Have you ever have some experience with putting in a multi-piece lens in the 
capsule with the radial hair? Well, I think I think the, 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 the I think the, 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 the what we're scared of is that three piece lens. You know, they're quite big. They put a lot of tension on the capsules. If you put it in exactly at 90 degrees, theoretically, you can you know tear the tear to the posterior capsule. I think that's sort of the the, uh, the idea or the issue. Yeah. With a single piece lens, the open loop is much less so because they open slowly. They have a high memory. They don't put that much pressure on the capsule. So I think that's also one of the big differences. So I, th I think a three-piece lens, I mean, we don't really use three-piece lenses very much in the bag anymore. But if, if, if I have to, like a high myope, good question. I think yeah, I could still could, put I, it I, in. But I think I've, Nick, I've never dared to try it. Yeah. Nick, I think you could do it. But as Oliver pointed out, I think it's this unfolding process. You don't want to have any pressure on any part. So this lens, where you put it in, just goes slowly in. You put it, it's almost like a capsule tensioning in this area because it opens. So I feel comfortable to put it in in radial tears. OK, so the next category. For some reason, I'm going the wrong direction. Very strange. OK, we're going negative, so I have to go left. That's Compromised vision. Sorry about that. Here we go. OK, the next category is innovation. And this is, comes from Japan, a development of a new irrigation aspiration tip with a variable aspiration port from Oki and from Japan. Surgeons have trouble disposing of debris they often encounter during surgery, such as remaining excess epinuclei and micronucleus fragments from the back of the iris. Many a surgeon have no doubt felt annoyed as they wait patiently for the fragments to be suctioned off by the IA or to carry out the procedure of using a hook with the other hand and pushing them into the aspiration port. He devised a variable aspiration port IA. The tip adopts an oval-shaped aspiration port of 0.4 millimeters by 0.5 millimeters in size. It also comes with a dial, making it possible to open and close the aspiration port to an optional size. With the aperture ratio of about 50%, it becomes the same aperture area in size as the port of standard IA. Even with the aspiration port opened 100%, the anterior chamber remains stable, making it possible to perform IA efficiently. Surprisingly, we found that this IA technique uniquely handles low-grade nucleus fragments as well by opening the aspiration port 100%. Next, micronucleus fragments were pulled and drawn out at 50% of the standard position and later opened to 100% or full size making it possible to suction them with ease. If a peristaltic pump was used, even if the port was open 100%, it was able to safely capture epinuclei and micronucleus fragments. If the port was open 50%, we learned that the usability equivalent to that of standard IA could be obtained. Just as the US tip has diverse shape, diverse possibilities are now possible with IA tips. Okay, when I saw this video, my first question was, why didn't I think of it before? Because it was so obvious, so, so, so making so much sense. <laughs> so what do you think about the clinical need for having such a viable opening for an uh, aspiration port? I, I think it's, it's pretty good because very often when you, when you remove the cortex, you have results some epinucleus which kind of a little bit harder and it's e not easy to get out with a very small devices and, and we even can put you know by manual devices but this can be opened and you sometimes can take this a little bit harder or let's say larger or more dense more thicker uh, uh, cortex material off if you open it neat idea well maybe not just for the cortex but for the epinucleus well, i mean a cortex is aspiration only nucleus is uh, is uh, thicker only uh, epinucleus you can do both and if you have a larger pore you can use it for soft lenses, for epinucleus, maybe just use the entire surgery of a soft lens just by aspiration if you have a large pore. And sometimes in very hard cataract, during the, the infusion aspiration at the cortex, you find out that some small particle, very hard part of the nucleus behind of the iris and coming down. So you have to go outside and take the fecro and time consuming if you get this. So it makes sense just to open up? Yes, you can open and fix it. Well, won't it affect the flow rate if you decrease the, the diameter? 
So would you have to change your flow rate on your FACO machine a little bit? Oh, they, uh, we, we showed only uh, a portion of the video here. This is a seven minute video. And it tested with ver various uh, uh, sizes and various aspiration rate. Did not change much. Okay. They, you do not need to change the parameters uh, when you do that. And is it reusable? Is it? Is it reusable? Seems, seems Reus like. No, I, I don't think it's clinically available yet. So. But seem to be from re-sterilizable, re re but then I would, can you clean this well enough? That's, probably, that's a good point. <laughs> it doesn't look that easy to clean. Okay. It's like a vitreous cutter in a certain way, and, and today we don't, we don't uh, use um, you know, reusable vitreous cutters anymore because we're quite worried about that region in the front. Interesting okay. question because of sustainability. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. We'll get to that Oliver. point later on. <laughs> No, I think that can, that can be flushed and then can, uh, I mean, carefully that can be uh, uh, okay. done even as reusable. Uh, what about using femtosecond laser? So we can make it like a waffle, make a lot of small particles, and then if you have a large pore aspiration mm -hmm. port, then, then it would make it much easier. You wouldn't need a faker machine, but just an IA machine. Correct. For this case, it's just correct. Yeah. Maybe. I don't know. What about if if if, if you would use a technique? Well, if you use your femtosecond laser and have really small pieces, then you could potentially take it out. But the problem with the smaller pieces sometimes really they all over the place, and sometimes you forget one, which is not nice a thing. And then then it can. So you know, depending on the hardness of the nucleus, it's sometimes just easier, or the pattern is jumps out easier just to have six pieces like we do in in in, Ketter, in FACO, take it out. So then it would not apply to that. But with small pieces, potentially. Could work. And how about uh, a new generation of FACO tips? We can have a variable opening for FACO tips. We have only, you know, <laughs> some kind of one size fits all. That's going to be a little more complex technically, I guess. It is. It yeah. is. But it could probably do. It's, it's, it's a good idea. I think we'll continue. Surgeons have trouble disposing. Sorry about that. Sir. For some reason, it's going the wrong direction. So here we go. This is residents in training. Uh, the first prize in that category, and it's um, anterior segment photography with, in, for, for, uh, intraocular, with an intraocular lens, you'll see it in a second, for residents, an innovative learning tool. Sorry. Here we go. I then started using the smartphone adapter, which could be attached to the slit lamp. It was a good tool, but needed a lot of adjustments, and it was tiring to keep removing it and putting it again and again. So let me tell you how I made my aspi. First, take a chart paper and a scale and a pen to draw a rectangle measuring 10 cm 1.5 cm. After folding the chart paper, you use a double sided tape, stick it on one side of the chart paper where we can attach the intraocular lens. You then remove the other side of the double sided tape, you take the 15 adapters intraocular lens and attach it on the circular opening and then you stick the other side of the chart paper and sandwich the intraocular lens on both the sides. I then take my smartphone and attach the ASP onto the smartphone camera with a microphone tape and it's ready, there you go. Oh, that's me taking ASPI picture on a patient in an outreach camp. These are few of my cataract related findings. These are intraocular related findings and complications. And we now have a WhatsApp group called ASPI Club, wherein we discuss and share interesting clinical findings of pictures on the group. Yeah, so I mean, I, I, I was just overwhelmed. I, I really like it. It's so ingenious. Um, so, so uh, what about put a multifocal lens then? What are we going to see then? <laughs> no, <laughs> just joking. It? Just joking. Well, but essentially, <laughs> but as soon as you, as you, um, as soon, you know, essentially, as soon as you have a lens which is unsterile for whatever reasons, and it's about 20 diopters, there you go. But they, they had a paper on this this morning, a free paper. And they also made a microscope out of this. So they took four lenses from 30 diopters each, had a 120 diopters uh, lens in total, and they could do microscopy with that. 
So in rural areas, they use this one to detect parasites in the, in the, in the, in the, in the conjunctiva, which they couldn't otherwise see because they don't have slit lamp access. So this is, I mean, it doesn't have to be too difficult, just keep it simple and, and be able to use that. Yeah, and these photos look perfect, huh? Very good. But Impressive. It's only anterior segment. Oh, of course, yeah. It's only uh, yeah, yeah. Sur surface or anterior segment. No, no, I understand. No, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's our topic. But if you connect it to the, to the slit lamp, you can have also posterior segment using the same technique with but the smart Probably phone. with the indirect ophthalmoscope with the side view, you can shot what they see with mm -hmm. maybe even, yeah. the side view. Or put an EDOF lens on it. <laughs> an EDOF lens. <laughs> yeah, that's right. you have a lot of, yeah. lot of range. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I just, you know, I, I wonder, this is, this is really, I mean, not only for outreach, but to be honest, you know, we have our phones with us all the time, and these are really high-resolution cameras, and, and there are obviously some adapters from slit lamps, and we know that, but, you know, this is just, uh, I think, uh, and, and obviously you can buy adapters, you know, and then they don't fit for the next phone generation, you have to get a new one. This is, you know, quick and dirty. In, in, and our, in our daily life, we just stop using cameras. We used to go with huge cameras and objectives and so on. Now nobody uses them. If you go on a trip, you just take your smartphone. That's so good. Yeah. So uh, uh, it is possible that this would, we would have for any state lamp. If we can have it so simple and so available, why not? This is an excellent it's idea. Very interesting <laughs> idea because in many practices, I think, you know, you have to have your slit lamp and then you have to buy your digital machine it costs you again and then you have like three rooms or five rooms and everywhere digital cost you this is very inexpensive if you if Most you do this and produces you know decent quick pictures well and also you know the and, videos. Next, and it's so quick to export you know so whatsapp and they obviously have a whatsapp group already so that means you're essentially doing telemedicine getting second opinions from from colleagues or having somebody take photographs and you actually do real telemedicine yeah uh, you know, so, so if you have somebody who, you know, like a, uh, somebody... And most ophthalmologists do not have cameras hooked to the slit lamp microscope. Yeah. Most of them. Well, they're cumbersome, they're expensive. Mm -hmm. And then you have to export the images, you know, everything becomes a, becomes a ball. So will you send me now every... I'll send you a lot of photographs. During the I'm week, gonna, I'm gonna, every time? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going I'm to put a multifocal lens and then see what we see. <laughs> so, some of the smartphones come with five cameras. I wonder what happens if you need to choose from... <laughs> from, uh, it, uh, becomes that complex. becomes quite complicated. I then started to... So... Okay, so now we are now coming to the grand prize, and that went to Liana Werner from the United States, and it was a video on the dead back syndrome. This is a new syndrome on old surgery. So, that's the video. There have been different reports of late postoperative IOL dislocation sharing the common feature of a very clear bag many years after surgery. Sam Maskett coined the term dead bag syndrome, referring to these cases. So what exactly is this syndrome? Clinical and surgical features include no signs of zonular instability noted during the implantation surgeries, which may be completely uneventful, Later, postoperatively, the capsular bag becomes diaphanous and floppy and unable to support the IOL within it. There may be initial subluxation of the IOL inside of the bag, sometimes through a peripheral defect, while the capsular bag itself is centered. In many cases, the reason for explantation is in the bag IOL dislocation. There is no association between this syndrome and a particular IOL design or material. The remaining capsule was removed. Note the clarity of the capsular bag without fibrotic or proliferative changes. Here, a dislocated single piece lens is removed from the eye after vitrectomy. The capsular rexus is intact and the bag, which is very clear, still shows good resiliency with appropriate zonular support. A three-piece lens was therefore positioned in the sulcus with capture of the optic through the capsular rexus. Pathological analysis of the in-the-bag dislocated lenses shows no fibrotic changes in the capsular bag and no proliferative material within it. The main feature of histopathology is capsular splitting or delamination. Its presence in areas of zonular attachment leads to dislocation. 
Lens epithelial cells are rarely seen or are completely absent from the inner surface of the capsule. There are a lot of unknowns in the etiology of the dead bag syndrome, as well as in its manifestations, as the findings described here could represent the severe end of the spectrum. Okay, now, uh, uh, same mask, uh, this is not a new syndrome. Same mask had coined it several years ago, but uh, none of us recognized this syndrome. And uh, uh, we have recently uh, several cases. We published four cases with spontaneous rupture of the posterior capsule, and the lenses fell back backwards. We did not recognize that this is a dead back syndrome. We uh, did, did not know the name. And since then, we had seven more. So all of a sudden, in the last four years, we have, uh, we have se seven cases. They report on uh, 10 or 12 cases. So how come we just see these cases now? and we did not see these cases. They, they were operated 15 years ago, 20 years ago. And uh, have you witnessed recently uh, these such cases? Could it be like pseudo-exfoliation syndrome? That you no, it has nothing to do with pseudo No, 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 but you only see it once you know what to look for and be aware of it. Mm -hmm. So that you see some um, uh, zonalysis and decentered lenses, but you're not aware of, of being the dead bed, that it's the dead what, what is typical to this case is that the posterior capsule ruptures spontaneously, nothing, no trauma, and then the lens drops because there is no fibrosis to hold it. So it just drops, it, in all of our cases, it just fell into the vitreous cavity, so nothing to hold it. So this was a very distinct uh, uh, feature, and only in the last years. So I wonder if yeah. any of you have seen it. Uh, I, I had a case uh, three years ago uh, who had it bilaterally, actually. So he had. I believe uncomplicated surgery uh, like uh, two, two or three years beforehand, a very clear capsule, which was then folding on it in itself. You know, so of all, I didn't even know what, what, where the capsule was intact or not intact. It was just very thin, very transparent, zonalysis, or you know, at least or diffuse zonalysis. So I removed the IOL. I had to remove the capsule. Unfortunately, I didn't bring it to histology. No. Now I would have. Um, and, and you know, the question really is, this capsule is splitting Obviously, there's no, the thing is there's no lens epithelial cells there. That's just the thing which is... Uh, this, this is probably the pathology, but uh, the question is, is it the capsular, uh, capsular pathology or zonalopathy? Because uh, uh, in most cases, there is no zonalopathy. There is no deistance. Right, but we still, yeah. but let's say zonules intact or not intact, you'd always have lens epithelial cells there. You usually have, you know, some kind of submarine no, swing. No, no cells, zero. Exactly. Zero. I think so that must be... I would think that was always what we were scared about when you know we was putting all kinds of substances into the capsule, flushing it during surgery, with the idea to eradicate all lens epithelial cells. You know, this sort of try to eradicate PCO. This was like 15 years ago. So Maloney, for example, from the Australia, he had Australia. You know, the sealing device. Perfect, and he, uh, perfect he put nice. I don't know you know all kinds of acid, you know, water, actual water, deionized water in there, and then. There were always a few lens epithelial cells that had survived, so that's why it didn't really work. But we always asked ourselves, what happens if they really are all gone? Is that capsule still going to be alive? No, or is it just going to die a, a slow death? Breaks, and essentially zonal disintegration. And that's obviously now, I, what's happening. I wonder here. why they removed the capsule in these cases. If it is just for, you know, for investigation or purposes, then I can understand. But clinically, it is not necessary. The capsule is still intact. And the capsule is still intact. When, uh, we, in our cases, we just... Uh, moved the uh, lenses anteriorly to the sulcus and then fixated or just left it there and this is it. We don't need to do anything because yeah, but the, case the I, capsule I just, is still working. Right, but you saw one case where, where he removed the capsule. It was, it was, All of the cases they moved the capsule. This right, well, the, but, well, whatever, but, but one of the cases it was re removed so easily that obviously the zones were very weak. It's actually good that Liliana Werner in Utah has taken on the topic because they have this great lab, other labs in the world, because eventually, first of all, we would like to know why that happens, and we don't know yet. But there are two long-term implications, I think. Number one is informed consent, because let's see, you know, we have that 10 years later, there are people still may say, you know, you had a rupture or something, I'm just you know, speculating. The second thing is we're now doing a lot of accommodate, you know, at least investigating accommodative IOLs in the capsular bag, and that is also a question, you know, how much do we have to take out of the bag in order to still maintain the opportunity? So that, I think that this is a very interesting topic for us in the future, for filling the capsular bag with new IOLs and also long-term complication rate informed consent. So very and interesting. Also, there are some new uh, uh, rings that are implanted into the bag so there would not be any PCO. 
but the question is, is having no PCO is good? You may end up with no cells and then they will just break and fall into the eye. Bye-bye. So. too much. Can so. you? I remember that was a discussion um, years ago when we started to polish the capsule and to remove with Rupert um, the oil and the manufacturer. Yes, so. and some colleagues were really scared that this will kill on long term the capsular bag. Don't clean too much. And, and so now I hope we will not be scared in the future seeing clear capsular bags um, and <laughs> that, that this will fall down or rupture. So that might be the case. Maybe these are cases where they have polished. Yeah, we don't know. Well, typically these cases uh, are, were, were done 15 to 20 years earlier. Yeah, yeah but that was, that was the area when, when it was done. One other thing is that in the American uh, series, it's all hydrophobic lenses and one silicone. In our series, six out of the seven are hydrophilic. So it is not the lens material. It is not even the design, which are all different. Yeah, maybe on the surgical technique, maybe. 20 years ago. So that means if you do surgery too well, it's not good either. <laughs> <laughs> you may have an old new syndrome. <laughs> All right, we'll go to the next video. This is a special prize video. It's called A Whole New World. Just listen in. My friend, this film is about my journey. I used to operate counseling, research, my uh, films, and so on. I enjoyed my career. Life seemed to be uh, perfect suddenly darkness in my world. Life threatening stroke happened to me. I woke up to whole new world. Sound. Yeah, I don't know. It didn't change anything. But there is a text anyway. It just says everything. Yeah, for some reason the sound is not working now, but. Maybe we can just stop it and start it again. Let me see whether that helps. Kids, I continue to hope. Now I am doctor and patient. I went from the top to zero. Doesn't matter, friends, except your new situation, but to enjoy. Life is so uncertain. Don't wait for Tomorrow. So, my friends, I am uh, proud, but journey is ongoing. I am grateful for supporting me and listening to my story. Yeah, so I've probably many of you know her because she's been to ESCRS many times, gave, gave, gave excellent lectures um, and papers. Um, and yeah. Uh, I, I would like to mention something. Uh, I'm one of the judges of uh, this uh, video festival, and when, when we saw this video, we knew it should get a prize. But what prize? It's not innovation, it's not scientific, it's not professional. So, uh, what prize should uh, be awarded? So we decided that this is a league by itself, so we would have a special prize. So we, we created a new category, which is a special category. And the other thing is usually when we give a prize, we ask, we bring the, uh, the, the author to the podium and ask them questions. In this case, uh, we decided not to ask any question. You don't need to ask any question. This is 
so inspirational, uh, this, uh, uh, this video. Uh, Ebe Vazavada, our good friend who is the father, told me that this was all her idea. Mm -hmm. It was all her initiative. She wanted to do it. She said, I have nothing to be ashamed of. It happened to me. It's an accident. I'm fighting for my life. And I would like to share the whole world with me. So if you did not see the video, the whole video, you should. Everybody should. Every ophthalmologist, every doctor, every person should look at this video. So inspirational. Yeah, it's, it's, and, and she's obviously very brave and has a lot of power because she's going through this, you know, tremendous rehab situation. Um, so, yeah. I think there's not much we can say about this, actually. But um, obviously, we wish, her, we wish her best, yes. Yes, so we've come to the end of this first video session. Thank you very much for being with us. And we're just doing a quick uh, change here on the stage, and we'll just continue in three or four minutes with the best posters, papers, and symposia.